Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I'm so happy to see you all today and to welcome you to another Explorer Classroom. Here at National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration, wonder, and storytelling to change our world for the better. And we believe that absolutely everyone should be able to safely explore the wonders of our world. So we run this Explorer Classroom program, which connects students from all around the world digitally with our amazing National Geographic Explorers. Our explorers are scientists, filmmakers, adventurers, researchers, photographers, and more. If you name it, we've probably got it. And once our students and our explorers are together here in the Explorer classroom, we have a short lesson and an extended Q&A. And today we're very lucky to be joined by Arena Molina. Arena is a conservationist and environmental scientist. Her work involves spending time with fishermen in different areas of the Philippines and using their knowledge to help identify vulnerable or locally extinct reef fish. Today, she's gonna to teach us about the fishing communities in the Philippines and the species that we're unfortunately losing. Before we get started with that, I do want to acknowledge that we're joined on screen by a, a couple of wonderful student groups and we have tons of you registered to watch along on YouTube. Hi, everyone. Um, today, our students are representing Bangladesh, Brazil, Canada, Colombia, India, and the United Kingdom as well as Arizona, California, Colorado, Connecticut, the District of Columbia, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Illinois, Kentucky, Massachusetts, Maryland, Michigan, North Carolina, New Jersey, New York, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Virginia, and maybe other places too. So if I happen to miss your state or your country, please let me know in the YouTube chat bar right beside this video. I'd love to say hi and give you a shout out in a little bit, but for now, I think that that is plenty of introduction from me. It is finally time to turn it over to Arena for today's Explorer Classroom lesson. I just start sharing my screen. Can you see it now? We sure can, it's full screen, it looks great. Cool. Um, hi everyone, um, how are you today? <laughs> Um, again, my name is Irina, and today we're going to the Philippines to talk about my fish project. But first, let me tell you a little story of how I got excited to study our marine ecosystems. So any one of you recognize this fish? For those of you who watch The Little Mermaid, you will surely know that this is Flounder from the movie. And during my childhood, I really loved um, that movie. I watched it over and over again, and back then, I always thought that there was something magical happening under the sea. And believe it or not, I was actually the one who drew this picture when I was 10 years old. <laughs> so um, looking back when I was a child, I really loved going to the beach, playing in the sand with my friends. And then fast forward to when I was 15 years old, I had my first snorkeling experience in the Philippines. And this was the very first time for me to see lots of fish underwater. And I was really excited to finally see the real Nemo underwater. So I was really amazed by what I discovered. And that discovery during my childhood really drove me to learn more about our marine ecosystem. And I wanted to learn the different kinds of fish and marine species living in it. Little did I know um, during that time that the Philippines is the global epicenter of marine biodiversity. We have different kinds of fish, corals, invertebrates. In short, we are bursting with marine life and we are proud of that. And this photo was actually taken at one of the marine sanctuaries located in Tawi-Tawi Island, Philippines. And because of the richness in marine biodiversity, our marine ecosystem has been a vital part of our country's resources and one that could affect our country's growth and development. And in fact, fish is where most Filipinos get their protein requirements. So millions of Filipino fishers actually rely on fish and fishery products as a source of food and income. However, our marine environment has been subject to different threats such as um, illegal fishing, destructive fishing practices, overfishing, and habitat degradation. And as a result, um, we could be losing fish species already. And this was the burning question we had in mind back then. 
that if reportedly the health of our marine habitats are at the decline, it is also possible that we could be losing fish in our marine ecosystems even before they have been described by scientists. And we need to document that as soon as possible. So what did we do? So for our project, um, we regarded fishers as our experts. Um, they are our experts because more often than not, they know more about the ocean than we do. And they live near the coast and they depend on the ocean for their survival. And we think that information about our changing marine environment could be buried in their, in their memories. And we need to document that as soon as possible. So um, back then I went to the field, I looked for fishers to interview and asked them questions like, what types of fish disappeared from your catches since the time you started fishing? I showed them different fish books where different types of fish can be seen. And you can see how happy they were in reminiscing and browsing through these fish books. Um, they, they were reminiscing about their encounters with marine wildlife that they saw. I joined fishing trips also, and this is to immerse myself with the stories of these communities and to know more about them. One time I joined the spear fishers underwater. Um, so we had a spear gun, I carried my own spear gun underwater, and I realized how hard it was to target and catch a moving fish. I also joined this hook and line fisher. Um, we circled an island three times until this happened. So we were only able to catch a single fish in an hour's worth of fishing. So just imagine how hard it is to catch fish nowadays. So what I really wanted to do during that time was to compile these anecdotes and convert it into hard data, which will be used for fisheries management. So over the years, um, overall, since the project began in 2012, we've interviewed more than 2,000 fishers and documented more than 50 species of fish that may have disappeared from catches. And an example is this moonfish, which was drawn by a fisher and is believed to have disappeared from catches in my study site in northern Philippines. Another example is this bumphead pirate fish. So this bumphead pirate fish is distinguishable with the bump in its forehead and it's the largest pirate fish of its kind and it's a schooling species um, which is known to bite the reef and scrape off algae from dead corals and since they munch on hard corals they are able to release fine sand-like particles that is believed to make up our white sand beaches and they are they're also believed to make up the islets in the middle of oceans where um, they serve as um, resting spots for our migratory bird species. So knowing that this bumphead pirate fish is already a rare find according to fishers, I was, I really got excited when I finally had a chance to see one underwater. And this was probably a group of around 10 to 15 individuals who were feeding on corals and you can really hear them munching on these corals underwater. So during that time, I thought that it's really important to take action to preserve their existence because they were really beautiful creatures and losing them may impact the health of the reef ecosystem where they are currently thriving. Unfortunately, there are also other threats that the marine environment um, is facing, such as coral beaching. And this is a result of our warming seas, which is aggravated by climate change. So during a bleaching event, corals relieve itself from the heat stress by releasing these plant-like organisms that live in their tissues called the zooxanthellae. And as a result, when they expel this zooxanthellae, they will lose their color and appear to be white or pale. And this is what the, the bleaching that we are seeing right now in this picture. And when this happens, these this bleach corals are not actually dead. They are not dead, but they are dying because they, the, the zooxanthellae that they just released provides them the source of energy and nutrients that they need. So in a bleaching event, um, if not managed properly, this coral bleaching may lead to habitat destruction, extensive habitat destruction, and this habitat 
destruction to drive species extinction. So how do we protect our reef? Um, maybe right now you're wondering how can we conserve our, our marine resources for future generations? So as an environmental scientist, I believe that it's important to engage communities in the protection as well as educating the general public about the importance of our marine ecosystems. And for my project, um, I gathered fishers and community leaders in my project site. And in this session, they were able to voice out their concerns about their fishing ground. And it was really a good venue for them to encourage the other fishers to be responsible fishers and to do away with destructive fishing practices and to start within themselves if they want the continuous recovery of their fishing ground. And this particular statement of a fisher actually struck me. He said that in the past, we can still see the fish in front of us. Today, we can only see it in pictures. This tells us that um, indeed, um, we need to do something about this and we need to ensure the sustainability of our marine resources or else the fish served on our plate nowadays might just be a memory decades from now. I'm also part of Philippine Coral Beaching Watch, which is a citizen science project that aims to encourage scuba divers and those who have access to a reef to report to us if they observe coral beaching in their reef areas. And our main goal is to find our reefs of hope in the Philippines. And these reefs of hope um, could give a steady supply of food, serve as buffer and protect us from typhoons and tsunamis in the future in the case of future bleaching events. And with the help of our citizen scientists, we need to actively look for these reefs of hope which are resilient to bleaching and we cannot let them die. Um, recently, um, in the past two months, we've actually been observing massive coral bleaching events in the Philippines. And this is actually sad. Um, and this photo was actually submitted to us just this month, this July. And it shows the fo a photo of a massive coral, which completely turned white. And when this happens, this is really due to our warming seas. And we could only hope that this coral will eventually recover in a few months time when the water gets cooler. Um, I also believe in educating the general public and I would like to encourage you um, to, to watch Grandpa's Reef, which is now available on Nat Geo's YouTube channel. And this is a four minute immersive um, underwater film I co-produced with other National Geographic explorers. And it follows the story of a young girl who wants to help protect the endangered coral reef of her grandfather. And in developing this film, um, we produced this because as a team, we believe that the more people see what a reef looks like underwater and how beautiful it is, the more people are, inspire, are inspired to help protect it. So maybe right now you're asking, what can you do as a person? Um, how can we respond to declining fish catches, to issues related to climate change, and for me, I think that every conservation action actually starts with the self and it starts with you guys. And it's now your turn to be young explorers yourselves and not just being young explorers, but also being young leaders who strives to make this world a better place. So my advice for you is to explore the world around you, even in just in your backyard, experience things you've never done before and this experience could be a learning experience, just like what you're doing right now, listening to this Explorer Classroom. And this could happen um, within the comforts of your home. Um, learn something new. And then when you learn something, share it to others and share it to others and inspire them to do the same and to take action as well. Um, to end, I'll just like to say that remember that there is no planet B. Um, we live in this wonderful world and we need to protect it. And all of us needs to work together to make this world a better place for everyone. So that would be all. Thank you all for listening and may fish be with you. Avrina, thank you so much. This has been amazing. I definitely want to reiterate to everyone that you can watch Grandpa's Reef. It's awesome. 
Um, here's my cat making her debut yeah. appearance on Explore Classroom. It's awesome. It's online. Um, it's always a blast to, to digitally immerse yourself in a reef. And I'd <laughs> love to reemphasize your point of there's no planet B. Um, I love that, that play on plan A and plan B. It's, yeah. it's so brilliant. <laughs> it's so fun. Um, thank you for that presentation and now it's time for questions so if you're watching along on youtube start sending your questions in in the chat bar we record everything you send in as you send it so you only need to send it one time please don't spam us um, but definitely send anything you're curious about we'd love to answer it i also want to give a quick shout out to um, a group of students watching in ukraine that we missed during our opening so welcome to valentina and friends and our first question of the day will come to us from an on-screen student. Let's visit Anulia for our first question. Hi, Anulia. Hi. So my question is, what like ocean has the most corals that are bleached? Um, what's your question again? What uh, oceans have the most corals that are bleached? Um, that's that's tricky. So. Um, we've experienced different massive bleaching events um, in the world. And um, in the Philippines, we've experienced one in 1998 uh, 2000, and 2016. So when there's a massive bleaching event, it actually means that vast um, coral reef areas have, have been bleached. And this, because this is due to um, the increasing warm surface temperatures. So um, we've, uh, we've noticed that recently um, the Great Barrier Reefs have been experiencing um, bleaching as well this year. And now um, sad to say that uh, we've also observed massive coral bleaching events happening here in our country. Awesome. And our next question comes to us from Ben, who is nine years old and is in Wales in the UK. Ben's wondering what your favorite type of coral is and what the strangest coral you've seen is. My favorite type of coral are those um, branching corals, uh, um, branching corals and also the folios corals. The folios corals are really beautiful underwater because they look like they're, they are flower-like. So it's like when you're, you're in a reef that's full of um, folios corals, you, the reef looks like um, a bed of uh, flowers around you. And when there's also, um, and if you also see a reef with lots of branching corals, um, it also really excites me because they are really beautiful and also col colorful. Awesome. Well, let's go to Sophie and Elise for our next question. Go for it. My question is how many uh, types of fish usually live in the coral reef? So um, in the Philippines, we have more than 2,000 species of fish. So just imagine um, that, um, that, that massive amount of fish that's swimming in our waters. So there's really a lot. And, um, the, Philippines is, and the Philippines is part of the coral triangle, which means that um, the coral triangle is an area where um, an area where um, there's a concentration of, there's a big concentration of brief species and diversity in this region. Awesome. And we've got Sydney, who's 11 years old in the chat bar, and they're wondering um, how old you were when you started exploring. You mentioned that you're never too young to start. Oh. <laughs> As, as young as maybe like six years old or five, um, as a child, I really liked um, to go biking. So I had my own little bike and um, I loved cycling in our neighborhood and I loved the feeling of um, the, the cool breeze that you feel when you're, when you're cycling. And that's actually the first time that I felt that like I'm exploring on my own because I had my own bike and I was free to go anywhere around the neighborhood. Awesome. And a follow-up from Sydney. Sydney wants to know how old you are now. Oh, right now I am um, 28 years old. So I just turned 28 last June. <laughs> wow. 
love that. I bet that sounds very old to some of our audience members, but very young to their parents. <laughs> so what a wonderful career. Um, and let's move to Anian and Tilly. It looks like they have some questions. Go for it, folks. Um, what type of animal is most commonly caught as bycatch in the Philippines? So as bycatch, um, the tricky thing about the Philippines is that it is a multi-fishery. So it means that since we have different kinds of fish, um, when fishers catch fish in their, uh, in their gill nets, usually it's different types of fish. But um, in terms of bycatch, uh, we've experienced um, reports on bycatch on um, marine turtles in the Philippines. And I think that's one of the most common bycatch as well. Brilliant. And we've got Jax from LA who is wondering what the oddest looking fish you've ever seen is. We saw those bump head parrot fish, but, but what else out there in the Philippines is pretty, pretty silly looking? The oddest, um, you can check what um, the humphead ras looks like. So the humphead ras is actually also, it's actually endangered, um, considered um, endangered. Um, and it also has a bump like the bump head pirate fish. Brilliant. All right. And let's visit Andrew for a question. Andrew, go for it. Um. I don't really have a question right now, so. All right, well, we can come back to you when you get one. Um, oh, Ania and Tilly are waving at me. Looks like they have another. They'll spot you, Andrew. <laughs> Go for it, Ania and Tilly. Um, in the oceans uh, around the Philippines, what is the top predator? The apex. The apex, we have um, sharks as well. So, um, we have sharks, we have um, different marine mammals as well. Um, that's considered one of the top predators. Um, yeah. Brilliant. We had a lot of chatter in the, in the chat bar around the time that you showed the picture of you up on that blue boat with the things sticking out on the side in the Philippines. What kind of a boat is that? And what are the sticks on the side used for? The boat, um, ah, okay, so the boat in the Philippines, so um, it has two sticks on the side and it helps the boat um, have balance when, when it's uh, traversing in, in um, high, uh, when, there are, when the waves are, are kind of rough. So it helps the boat um, be more stabilized when it's moving. Brilliant. And then we've got another question coming in from Manola, who is wondering about the land animals of the Philippines. So we, we got to see a, a good amount of those aquatic animals, but what's your favorite cute land animal from your travels? Um, we have uh, a lot of endemic species in the Philippines. So um, we have the Philippine eagle. Um, we have uh, the tamarows, which are um, like water buffaloes. Um, we have pangolins as well, and there are a lot of cool stuff that you can see um, in the Philippines because the Philippines is not only diverse in terms of marine life, it's also diverse in terms of our um, terrestrial ecosystems. So cool. All right, let's go back to Anulia for another question. Go for it, Anulia. Uh, how do you, how do you, um, humans, coral reefs. How do I what? How do I? No, how do humans? What is that again? How do I? How do the humans around the, the reefs hurt them? Like the, the surrounding ah. communities? What's going on so, that, that damages the reefs? So sometimes um, uh, some fishers are practicing destructive fishing practices. So that includes dynamite fishing, and that includes also cyanide fishing. Cyanide fishing is when they use this um, harmful chemicals underwater 
and these harmful chemicals um, make the fish like uh, sway and have a headache and it's and some sort of a headache and that makes them easier for the fishers to catch them and that's a, that's considered illegal since if the they use these harmful substances it could also affect the surrounding um, corals where they where they um, input those chemicals and when the fishers also use dynamite fishing it will also dis destroy um, uh, large areas of um, corals which takes a long time for for it to recover right and we have so many different like emojis in the chat bar uh, cyanide and dynamite are about the two most dangerous things i can think of uh it's very wild to hear that people are fishing with that i'm glad it's illegal um and we've got a question from ben who's wondering if you've ever been injured while diving um no fortunately i haven't been ah uh, wait i have been injured because i accidentally um touched this toxic um, hydrozoa. So it's one of those species underwater that um, when you it's uh, when you touch it, it's kind of stings. Um, I think that's, that's just one of the times that I got hurt underwater, but it's not a big deal. <laughs> it's not scary underwater. It's still fun to go diving and to be like floating underwater and just be immersed with what you're seeing and how beautiful it is and how coral colorful it is underwater. Awesome. It looks like Andrew has a question. We can come back to you and, and give you another chance. Go for it, Andrew. Um, so and one, my question is, have the, any fish died because of a certain coral they couldn't go in? Of a certain? Coral. Of a certain... One, one more time for us nice and loud, Andrew. Of a certain coral. Oh, of a certain coral? Okay. So the fish, um, the coral is actually the habitat of a fish. So um, it doesn't, um, a coral doesn't really hurt the fish, but it's, um, it houses the fish. Like for example, um, Nemo, for example. So Nemo lives in a sea anemone, which is um, on a sea anemone and they have a mutual relationship. Awesome. And speaking of coral and its relation to the ecosystem, we've got Matthew and Jax who are wondering about some of the other purposes of coral. Could you speak a little bit more about, about what it does in the ecosystem? So corals also serve as buffers in the marine ecosystem. So for example, if we have um, strong typhoons and tsunamis, the corals can actually um, serve as a buffer before um, these strong storm surges reach the coast. So when there's a coral reef, um, it reduces the wave energy that could potentially affect our coastal communities near the coast during typhoons and tsunamis. Awesome, so many cool jobs for coral. And Sophie and Elise definitely have another question. Let's visit them again. Are some fish about to be extinct due to climate change? Um, climate change uh, drives could drive species extinction, but um, the establishment of a particular fish that is linked to um, climate change is because uh, it, it's climate change is a very complex problem, and climate change affects um, contributes to other uh, other other processes that could affect the extinction of species. So it's very hard to connect the two. But I could say that climate change could drive species extinction because if there's climate change, because um, climate change could cause the warming of our seas and warming of our seas could cause coral bleaching and coral bleaching, if not managed properly, could um, lead to the death of massive, um, massive areas of 
um, great extents of coral reefs. And when you lose your coral reef, you lose um, the habitat of your fish species. And that's when your fish species could go extinct. Awesome. And speaking of fish, we've got a question about that parrot fish, that bump head parrot fish. Um, ben said that you mentioned that it eats coral and is wondering if that hurts the coral and, and why it does that. Okay, so the, the bump head parrot fish, it's um, a part of its diet um, is algae from the dead coral and also the live coral. And when it does that, so when it munches on corals, it's actually actually helping um, drive uh, the diversity in the coral reef ecosystem. Because when they eat and scrape off the algae from dead corals, um, they actually allow coral recruits um, to, to thrive within these reef communities. And, and when, when you have more coral recruits in these reef communities, the more diverse and the more, the more, um, the easier for the reef to recover. And the good thing is this bump head pirate fish and um, most pirate fish has actually munch on fast growing corals. So these are your, your um, branching corals. So what it means that since they only munch on um, fast growing corals, it's also easier for the corals that they munch to recover. Awesome, thank you. And Tilly has another question. Go for it, Tilly. What type of coral is being bleached the most in the Philippines? Um, right now, we've seen um, uh, folios corals to be bleaching in some parts of the Philippines and also branching corals. And there are also places where um, there's a coral called mushroom coral. And it's fascinating to see that um, a photo of a citizen scientist um, that was submitted to us, it was all mushroom corals that have bleached in that study site. And speaking of corals, we've got some questions about your background, Arena. What is this reef that you're virtually on today? Where is it? How deep is oh. it? All kinds of questions. You can actually see that when you watch Grandpa's Reef. So this is um, a reef in uh, Upper Reef Natural Park, which is um, uh, this, uh, one of our large marine protected areas here in the Philippines. And it is where we, we shot our film called Grandpa's Reef because it houses um, vast areas of coral reefs that are still healthy. And it's also where the bumphead parrot fish still thrives. Awesome. And we've got Andrew with another question. Go for it, Andrew. Um, my question is, have you ever seen um, a fish that was dead in its uh, home? A fish that's dead in its home. In its home. Um, there was a time when I was diving so I've come across this um, moon ras, and it was it it was laying flat in the in the ground, and it seems to be dead, but it was breathing during that time. So I was wondering if it was asleep or something. So um, I think that was not dead. And but there are also, but there was a time also when I saw this fish. Um, that was munched by another fish because some fish are carnivores, right? So some fish eats other fish also because that's part of their um, diet. And I saw this fish just laying on the ground who was, uh, that was um, eaten on by another fish. It's brutal, but I guess it's, it's part of the circle of life. Yeah, um, it's part of the circle of life. Yeah. We've got some users who noticed those Oculus headsets in one of your yeah. slides. Did you do underwater VR filming? And if so, how did that work? Yes, so um, Grandpa's Reef was um, an underwater uh, VR film. So what we did was we had our cam cameras with us. We had um, 
the expedition lasted for two weeks. So it was really hard. Um, and we and all our shots were based on luck because when we had our camer cameras underwater, the only thing that we can do um, is hope that there are fish species that it would go in that camera and circle around because since the since it's a 360 film, so it captures everything around you, right? So when we when we um, when we were producing that film and when we were diving, we had to place that camera underwater and then um, look for a nearby coral which is large enough for us to hide and then just leave that camera underwater and just hope that there's fish to be like circling around the camera. So you should watch cool. Grandpa's Reef. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Everybody should watch Grampus Reef. It's so cool. It's such a nice escape to get underwater to such a beautiful reef. Yeah. Um, and it's such a powerful story. And it looks like an Ian until I have another question. Go for it. How fast are coral being beached? So the corals, because um, coral bleaching happens when there is a prolonged heating underwater. So usually, um, um, there are corals that would bleach first than the others. So, for example, these branching corals, they usually bleach first than the other corals. And when this happens, um, it could bleach a wide range of branching corals. And then as, as, as it progresses and when the heating is still happening and it's still warming, other areas and other types of corals that are most susceptible to bleaching could also bleach as well. And that you will end up um, having a whole reef just damaged with um, coral bleaching. Right, and Anulia has got another question. Go for it, Anulia. Uh, so my question is, how are coral reefs made? So coral reefs are made. Um, it's the bill um, through because uh, cor corals are made of calcium carbonates, right? So when the corals um, reproduce, um, when the coral spawn, so when it spawn, it will release um, it will release this coral polyps, and then it will um, settle on the ground, and then. As the and as time progresses, the calcium carbonate would build on um, the corals until it will grow and grow eventually. Awesome. And Andrew's got another one as well. Go for it, Andrew. Okay. So um, my question is: um, Does your um, so your background has a lot of coral on top of each other? So I'm wondering if it looks like um, that still today. Yeah, so today um, we haven't received any reports at Upper Reef Natural Park where this photo was taken. So hopefully it's not um, badly affected like the other sites that we've been observing recently. Awesome. And Arena, have you ever had a species that you thought was extinct that you that came back? Um, I've haven't experienced. Uh, I have. I haven't experienced um, that scenario yet. But hopefully, the species that, yeah. So hopefully, the species that that the fishers are saying that have disappeared from catch could eventually go back and like appear in their reefs again once the their coral reefs um, are suitable enough for these reefs to for this species to thrive again. Awesome. All right. And Sophie and Elise have one more. Go for it. My question is what are the fish's reactions for uh like what is the first reaction for the fish when they meet the humans? Oh, so um, so different fish have different behaviors. So there are fishes that are territorial. 
Um, so this, for example, the territorial fish would um, like be face to face on you um, underwater and then pro just protecting their, um, their home. Like for example, there's this uh, fish called jewel damselfish, which is a territorial fish and it is protecting its algal garden. So this jewel, jewel dam, damselfish eats algae and it has an algal garden in its, um, for itself. So when you're, you're getting near this algal garden, which is um, its territory, its territory, the fish could like um, go in front of you and just seems to be like saying, don't, don't visit here, don't come here. <laughs> So cool, but, what a fun yeah. example. But there are also some fish that are just like, they're swimming and they will just like, for example, schools of fish that they that, that um, won't even notice that you're around. So they're just circling there and just like a bustling city of schools of fish around you. Awesome. And Arena, what can students do to get involved in your work and start protecting reefs and, and fish uh, in their own waterways and, and around the world? Well, um, so right now, um, I'd encourage you really to watch Grandpa's Reef um, and um, get a feel of what it's like underwater. Um, if you have virtual headsets, um, go use them and because for a, mo for a mer more immersive experience. And, visit grandpasreef.com um, to access educational materials that goes with the film because um, it talks about um, how plastic pollution could impact the reefs and the animals that are, um, that our, that are captured in the film. And you could also um, watch uh, other documentaries on coral beaching. Um, with, um, you can watch Chasing Coral, which is an award-winning documentary that tackles the coral beaching phenomenon. And um, for those of you who are interested for, um, in trying out games about coral reefs, I've recently um, encountered this um, app called NemoNet in the App Store, which is a game developed by NASA where you will get acquainted with different coral reefs around the world. So cool. Thank you for those recommendations. And then do you have any general advice for all the young explorers out there joining us today? Um, I guess just keep on learning new things and get excited about the world around us and how beautiful it is. Just be curious and just ask some questions. And when you have those burning questions, ask someone or search the internet. We live in a, in a world where there's... Um, a load of information made available. And um, also uh, try to minimize your environmental impact, um, environmental footprint. So eat locally. Um, when, you're, when you like to eat seafood, um, try to make sure that the seafood that you are eating um, come from sustainable sources. And um, also try um, to fight climate change. And to do that, you could, um, do that by saving energy. So just consume less, save energy. And lastly, um, if you learned something today, um, remember to share it to others, to your friends and family members as well. Such great advice. Well, Arena, thank you so much. And thank you especially for your dedication. I know that you're on the other side of the world and it is incredibly early in the Philippines right now. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, kids. Thank and you for your amazing questions as well. Really good questions today, you're right. <laughs> um, and everybody out there watching, you can check out Explorer Classroom and many, many more free educational resources at natgeoed.org. And we hope to see you at more Explorer Classroom soon. For now, let's turn on everybody's microphones and nice and loud before we turn before we sign off for the day, let's say goodbye and thank you to Arena. Ready? Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.